Good evening, uh, everyone, uh, except Roger. Good morning, Roger. Good morning. Um, it's amazing that you, you were able to make some time to, um, to have a, a conversation tonight about um, Julian Assange and the last few days. Um, I, on Monday, um, a UK judge blocked the US request to extradite Julian Assange. Uh, the, the legal basis of the ruling is that <clears throat> extradition would be oppressive by reason of mental harm. Funnily enough, today, the same judge um, denied Julian Assange bail. I guess UK prisons are incredibly much better than, than US ones. Uh, that's even though uh, I found a quote by Niels Melzer, the UN special reporter on torture, who said that Julian Assange was showing all symptoms associated with prolonged exposure to psychological torture. Um, that's when he visited him in jail in 2019, so a year ago. Um, but so we're here tonight to, to sort of ask the question, what does this mean, uh, the, last, uh, the last decisions for Julian Assange himself, but, but more, more than that for journalism, investigative journalism, and, um, and I guess democracy in general. So once again, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you um, all tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to have um, uh, Stefania Maruzzi with us. Uh, she joined us at, at the last minute, but I thought it was very important to have Stefania on tonight. Um, Stefania has been, uh, she's an investigative journalist She's been working for the major Italian daily El, uh, Il Fatto Quotidiano, and she's worked on all WikiLeaks secret documents uh, since it started. Um, for the last five years, she's been fighting for a Freedom of Information Act battle to defend the right of the press to obtain the full documentation <laughs> on Julian Assange and WikiLeaks to actually recon reconstruct the case uh, factually. So, Stefania, uh, it's amazing to, to have you here with us tonight. You are going to have to go, I think, in about 20, 25 minutes, so I will let you speak first. You, were, uh, you followed the trial, uh, the court proceedings on, on Monday and Wednesday. Um, as someone who's followed very closely the WikiLeaks, in a way, story for many years, uh, what do you take out the last few days? So, Frank, thank you for <clears throat> this invitation and for this panel with great people. So let me tell you that I was quite upset uh, um, throughout the, all this uh, hearing, extradition hearing from the very beginning. You have to realize that in the last 11 years, I have published all the very same documents and revelations, all of them for the last 11 years. And I was never put in prison. I was never arrested. I was never tortured. And I was always respected. And, and so I cannot uh, see what they have been doing for the last 10 years, last decade on Julian Assange. And I feel the duty to speak out because I've been there from the very beginning. And I feel like uh, the drone and the, the saved by Primo Levi, where you witness a uh, talented journalists who reveal exceptionally important information in the public interest, uh, which has allowed to reveal torture, which has allowed to reveal the pressures on, uh, uh, for example, on Italian uh, politicians to block extradition of CIA agents involved in the extraordinary rendition of Abu Omar in Milan. He was kidnapped in the middle of the day in Milan, I see if he was in Pinochet child, uh, Chile. And so, I mean, I cannot, I cannot accept how he has been uh, treated. Uh, you have to realize, first of all, that in the last 10 years, I met, the last time I met Julian Assange as a free man was the 28th September, 2010. So in the last 10 years, I have always worked with him for my newspaper confined under house arrest, confined in the embassy without an hour outdoors. I mean, we, we give an hour outdoors 
to the mafia killers who kill children, I mean, and uh, in the British um, prison of Belmarsh. So for me, it's, uh, it's uh, so, you know, it's uh, so, I, I cannot stay silent about this treatment. And this sentence uh, is terrible. I mean, on the one hand, we are relieved because uh, his uh, extradition appear now <clears throat> uh, denied, but it was denied only on the basis of his physical mental health and all the problems and all the arguments about uh, uh, the fact that it was absolutely right publishing, revealing war crimes and torture were basically all rejected. And the political persecutions argument by the Julian Assange defense was completely rejected. And uh, everything was rejected apart from this uh, health condition, which can be easily bypassed by the US because they can offer uh, at the next appeal, they can say, well, we will offer you some guarantees. He will be treated fairly. He will not put under very oppressive conditions. He will not be putting ADX Florence uh, with El Chapo. <laughs> and they can get easily around the, 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 the sentence so they can easily win the appeal. So I'm really, really terrified about this sentence. And I'm really upset he remain in prison, of course. And, and for you, Stefania, as an investigative journalist yourself, that has taken some risk in publishing the WikiLeaks uh, leaks, um, could this set a, a, a very dangerous precedent for future whistleblowers uh, or investigative journalists as well? Absolutely. If you read the sentence, I mean, I have read the sentence, the Vanessa Baraitzer uh, judgment is uh, absolutely dangerous because uh, she makes clear that uh, some of the activities, the publications activities, goes go well beyond uh, journalism, investigative journalism. She calls uh, um, responsible journalism. What does it mean, responsible journalism? I mean, if it is not responsible to publish documents which reveal war crimes, torture in a democracy, I don't know what's, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what's a responsible journalism. I mean, you have to realize what these documents reveal. I have been on those documents for the last decade. They allowed to reveal 15,000 de civilian deaths in Iraq, previously unaccounted for. They allowed to reveal the pressures on authorities to uh, to grant impunity to the CIA agents which kin who kidnap people, torture, rape them in the extraordinary rendition. They allow to reveal collateral murder. They allow to reveal the, all the crimes, both from the ta Taliban and from the US troops and coalition troops in Afghanistan. I mean, if, if this is not proper, great journalism, I'm not sure what, what you can call journalism, you know, this sentence is devastating. This case is devastating. That's why I'm so, I mean, I'm so intense about this case. We cannot lose this case. We cannot lose this case. If we lose this case, it's the end of journalism, exposing war crimes and torturing a democracy, I mean. And, and I wanted to ask you a last question before going to the rest of the panel. Um, Julian Assange, I mean, mainstream media has pretty much ignored ignored his plea for the last few years. Only, you know, very few articles appear on the main, in the mainstream media. Uh, most of the others were on like independent or alternative press. So what does this case also says or tells us about corporate mainstream media? Look, I want to provide you a fact. This is not my opinion, this is a fact. In the last 10 years, he has remained arbitrarily detained and this is not my opinion, it's the UN body in charge of establishing who is arbitrarily detained and the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which established Julian Assange has been arbitrarily detained since 2010. In the last 10 years, he has remained arbitrarily detained. Not a single journalist has tried to get the documents and, and look for the truth, for the facts as we are supposed to do. So he took an Italian journalist completely alone, I, uh, uh, paying from my own pocket 
because no one wanted to do it. So you have had hundreds of journalists covering the case. We have seen dozens of journalists in these days covering the hearing. None of them have tried to get the documents and see, look, let me look what's going on in London because these men has remained arbitrarily detained since 2010, is uh, uh, confined in an embassy. I think this is a dramatic failure of journalism. And had we not have these timid, absent newspapers and media, he would have been in a different situation. Had the media be aggressive, had they been vocal about their situation, about his treatment, we are free. We got scoops from WikiLeaks. We got dozens of revelations. We are safe. We are completely safe. No one arrested us. And he, he has gone through hell. I mean, we, we sh with some solidarity, with, with some proper investigation of this journalism, this case would have been completely different. Thanks a lot, Stefania. Um, Yanis, I, I wanted to come to you. You, you have spoken to Julien uh, a few times over the years. Um, a lot of um, emphasis has been put on his psychological and mental health. Uh, could you tell us about, I mean, the last time you spoke to him, the last time you saw him, or about the conditions in which he was detained and his, and his, his spirit or his mental health? Well, thanks, Frank. Look, the last time I visited him at Belmarsh was in uh, February. Um, and, and that's where I did actually uh, witness the conditions. Uh, not his cell, of course, I didn't get to see his cell, but I don't need to see his cell because, you know, I looked at everything, the, the, the surrounding, um, his surroundings, and um, it was very easy to extrapolate from that um, and to use the fact that for 23 hours a day, 23 hours a day, he is incarcerated in solitary confinement. Uh, Frank, if I were for a year, 23 hours a day in this room of mine, which is not the cell in Belmar's prison, I'm, I'm telling you that I would have flipped. I would have topped myself. Um, I don't think I would have managed to survive the way he does. Uh, that doesn't mean he's surviving well. Uh, when um, I sat down with him, uh, by the way, I was not allowed to touch him. Uh, but nevertheless, the moment I saw him, I worked, went over to the other side and hugged him. And, um, you know, four or five uh, prison officers uh, started moving towards me as if I had committed uh, a crime against humanity. But anyway, um, we sat down and a torrent of uh, argumentation came out of, of Julian. You could see he was frail. Uh, his eyes were moving left and right, left and right, you know, typical effects of incarceration, of um, uh, sensory deprivation, but his mind was trying to squeeze into a minute material, Im impressive material, uh, intellectual material, uh, political um, argu arguments and analysis uh, that would have taken you know, normal people a much longer space of time during which to articulate. And at some point I said to him, I'm so glad that, that, that you're so lucid because, you know, we are all worried about your state of mind. And he said, well, do be worried because for the 23 hours a day I spend in the cell, most of it, I'm struggling not to lose it, to keep it together. And I can tell you that I'm not doing very well. Uh, it's only when I know that I'm going to meet someone, which doesn't happen very often, or pick up the phone and talk to somebody, that you know all this anxiety, all this huge angst uh, to remain uh, with it, that's the expression he used, um, is focused. And it feels as if once I go through this, because he doesn't have long to speak to people, then immediately after that, he's facing an abyss. He's staring into an abyss. Uh, so, um, after that, um, I had the great uh, privilege of receiving phone calls from him, from pay phones. He was allowed occasionally to, uh, to pick up the phone. The last time, I've made some notes so that I can share them with you and everyone. The last time we spoke was on July the 13th. He called me from a pay phone and he said, hi, this is Julian. 
from Belmarsh. I thought, okay. <laughs> I sat down where, wherever I was in the middle of no, I don't remember what. And he, he went straight to it because he knew he had nine minutes, 10 minutes max. max. And he said, uh, Yanis, I wanted a, spe a perspective on world developments out there. <laughs> As you can imagine, I have none here. <laughs> So I went straight into the kind of thing that I was thinking at that moment. I was not prepared for anything like that. So I told, I told him that in my estimation, you know, 2020 was an important year because the world of money decoupled from capitalism. You can see the financial markets are doing magnificently, uh, whereas capitalism is going down the drain. And immediately he came back to me saying, that he says, this proves that governments and central banks can keep corporations afloat even when they sell next to nothing at the marketplace. These are his precise words, right? Um, and um, then he asked me, he said, Yanis, how important is consumption to capitalism? You know, what percent, he wanted numbers, what percentage of GDP is it at stake um, when people actually consume? And so how, to what extent do we need, does capitalism require people to buy stuff? So, um, you know, I tried to answer with some numbers, but th then I honed in on what matters that, you know, uh, capitalism doesn't really need um, uh, workers, except that robots that replace workers cannot buy the stuff that the robots produce. And then there is a realization problem without workers to exploit so that they, they can keep some of the value they produce in order to buy the stuff that they're producing, and then it goes in. So I yeah, said that. And then immediately he said, um, I very much fear, he said, Jens, that this is going to benefit Trump and people like Trump, because they know how to feed off anger, uh, the anger of the multitudes uh, towards the educated upper middle class elites that own the machines. So he was completely with it. And so we talked about socialism for the oligarchy <laughs> and austerity for the many. And, and, and then he said, yeah, this, this is the problem with Bolsonaro and you know, the, the, uh, the ultra-right, that unlike the left, unlike us, they know how to form a coalition between rich people and the disconnected working class. And as he was telling me that, you know what? Most of the prison officers here in Belmarsh support Trump. Not even Boris Johnson or Farage, but Trump, Donald Trump in Britain. That sounds, uh, at that point, the line went click <laughs> and it died. But let me just, Frank, since I have the floor, just to conclude. Um, let's be clear. The reason why he's there is, I think, best expressed by my, Mike Pompeo. You know, Trump's first CIA director and even to, to this day, Secretary of State. He said that, Remember, he described WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence service. And you know what? He's exactly right. That's what WikiLeaks is. It's a non-state hostile intelligence service. Precisely that which every newspaper, every radio station, every television station ought to be, but is not. This is what the BBC should be. Uh, this, this is what you know, the great newspapers should be non-state hostile intelligence services, but they're not. Mm. And the reason why he's in there, because they're trying to kill him. It is really very simple. It, they're not, you know, doing things that may have as a repercussion his death. They're doing things that are designed to have as their repercussion their, his death. He poses problems for them now because there is a movement now, because thankfully a lot of people who were scorning those of us who were supporting Julian during the dark ages of 2014, 2015, 2016, now uh, have somehow have been mobilized and they're coming out in support of Julian. That's a good thing. Welcome back to them. Uh, shame on them for not being here all the time, but you know, doesn't matter. All is forgotten, welcome back. But let us not forget that what is now happening is war criminals are trying to kill the body and the soul of Julian Assange. And it is our job to create a movement that will make their life difficult to such an extent that they will say, let him live. Let's save his life before we do anything else. Thanks, thanks, Yanis. Uh, Brian, um, I actually wanted to talk to you about this. Um, I mean, Yanis touched upon it 
an opponent in the last uh, few minutes of his of his uh, speech, but uh, they want to make an example out of Julian Assange, right? I want I want to I wanted to have your views on this, and also because we all we spoke about it a few days ago as well. Uh, in your opinion, what is really what this case is really about? What is the Julian Assange case really about? And your mic is is off. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you, both Yanis and Stefania. I, I'm very moved by what both of you said. Um, Julian is a threat because he exposes an illusion that we are generally being told to support. And that illusion is that we live in a democracy. So the fundamental concept of democracy is that people make decisions about their future and about the state that they live in. And the fundamental assumption of democracy is that people have the information on which to make those decisions. So clearly for democracy to work, we have to have good information. Otherwise we'll make bad decisions. But um, when people do give us good information as Julian did with WikiLeaks, then that actually becomes a problem because that information reveals what is actually going on, particularly in the military sector in his case. And that is not something that anybody wants to know about. That is not a story that they want to be told. Now, why is that such a sensitive story? It's not only because of human rights violations, though of course that's a part of it. No country wants to be accused of those, but it's, it's really because it chips away at one of the most fundamental engines of capitalism, which is the military industrial complex. And you will have noticed that the other day, um, America unilaterally, I think with only four congressmen objecting to it, or congresswomen, I think they were actually objecting to, uh, agreed to a, a defense bill this, this year, a Pentagon bill of three quarters of a trillion dollars three quarters of a trillion dollars. That is such a lot of money. Um, and of course it's up from last year and it's up from the year before, it keeps going up. Now, what is that money actually for? Is it defending anybody against anything? No, it isn't actually. Um, there's very little military engagement going on. There's very little need for it. We don't really have enemies of that kind. If we really want to use the military well right now, we would direct them towards dealing with the pandemic. All of those military research laboratories that are making nerve gas and heat rays and various kinds of bombs could be much better served working for, um, to help us with something that we really need defending against, um, pandemics and so on. Um, but in fact, we have this huge machine that needs to be sustained. The machine is so completely ubiquitous, particularly in America, where every single state has people who are working for military contractors. Um, so for a congressman to say, or a senator to say, we don't want military spending at this level anymore is effectively for him to throw people out of their jobs. And that's always the threat that the arms manufacturers use. And their way of dealing with this is to make sure that any large weapons project is, has workers located in every state of the union. Uh, typically they, they will manage 48 or 49 states. You know, one state will make washers, another one makes fuses, another one makes fins, whatever is needed. It's, it's a well, well oiled machine. And when Julian comes along and says, do you want to know what that money's spent on? Do you want to know what happens with all of those three quarters of a trillion dollars that go into this? This is what happens. Journalists get shot up and ordinary people get shot up and wedding parties in Afghanistan get destroyed by drone attacks. So this is really bad publicity for the whole um, engine that's driving this thing. And I think singling out Julian is a way of saying to journalists altogether, look, just don't touch this subject, okay? It's too risky. You, really, you're getting in too deep here. Just stay away from it. So I 
fully congratulate Stefania for actually putting her finger into this pie. It's, it's a dangerous thing to do. And uh, it obviously isn't a very financially rewarding thing to do otherwise, either. But um, congratulations for doing it. But anyway, that, that's what I think is behind this. Um, you know, Julian has come to represent, um, at least in their eyes, he's come to represent the awkward bastard who's going to keep asking questions. And what's a real shame is that he hasn't come to represent to journalists in general, the awkward bastard who's defending their job, because that's what he really is. Without Julian doing what he's doing, or, or if Julian finally is effectively murdered for doing it, that's a way of saying to all investigative journalists, don't bother, it's too risky. And unfortunately, so far, they seem to be agreeing. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Brian. Stefania, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're going to have to go in about five, 10 minutes, right? Yes, I can stay 15. OK. So, to, yeah. I, I, want, I want you to ask you a question then, because we, we, I don't want to keep you for too long, about journalism in general. We, we've spoken about investigative journalism, the case of Julian, of WikiLeaks. but. I mean, the attacks on journalists all around the world, including in so-called democracies uh, like France and Belgium and Italy, is, is heavier and he heavier every day, right? I mean, in France, if you, if you've seen the last demonstration, journalists are being targeted by the police. They're being uh, brutalized by the police. They're being sent to court by the police. In Italy, it's the same. In Belgium, it's the same. So you can see that there is, uh, in a way, a concerted um, attack on, on journalists and absolutely. journalism, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, more and more, more difficult. I mean, we are very poor, so they know we don't have resources, and all the important media are in the hands of oligarchs, powerful people who have powerful interests. Let me tell you one thing: to keep doing my work on WikiLeaks, I had to leave my newspaper. I was working for La Repubblica for a major. Italian Daily La Repubblica, I had to leave. I had to choose whether to keep working on WikiLeaks or whether to keep working for La Repubblica. It was no longer possible to do my work there. And I'm afraid to say so, but <laughs> this is what happened, I'm afraid to say. So, I mean, it's uh, this work is tremendously important. You know, it's a, let, me, let me give you just an example of what we were able to do Thanks to these uh, documents. So let me give you an example of proper journalism. So let me give you this example. I'm not sure if you realize that Italy was the only country in the world to get a final sentence for the CIA agents involved in this extraordinary rendition of a Milan cleric, Abu Omar. So we were the only one able to get a final sentence for these 26 US nationals, most, almost all of them CIA agents. Our uh, formidable prosecutors were able to uh, put them under trial in absentia and to get a final sentence. But they never spent a single day in prison. Why? Because six justice ministers, six justice ministers, both progressive and um, conservative, refused to send the arrest warrant to the US. So at the end of the day, Italy, which was the only country to, to, do just, to make justice about this case, was condemned by the European Court of Human Rights for granting them impunity. Thanks to the documents, the WikiLeaks documents, we got evidence of US pressures on all single important Italian politicians, Stelli, don't send the arrest warrants. Don't do it. So without these documents, it would have been, maybe, of course, we could imagine this kind of pressure, but, but we could have never ever got this evidence. So the only way to get this evidence is thanks to these documents. And that was a crucial piece of journalism, which without these documents we would have been impossible. So let me, let me tell you how upset I am that Basically, Julian, after publishing these documents, had never known freedom again. Whereas the people from the war criminals like Blackwater are out, and the CIA agents are 
free as the air. Uh, the Blackwater cre were criminals have been pardoned. So how can you accept this upside down world? I mean, you cannot accept if you are a, if you are a, a man, who, or a person with an ethical stance, you cannot accept this. So I cannot be silent about this treatment. You know, that's why I want to win this case. I want to contribute as I can with my journalism to win this case. Many, many thanks again, uh, Stefania. And, and again, as Brian said, thanks for the work that, that you're doing. Um, I wanted to come to you, Roger. We, we've spoken about Julian me being made an example of. Um, we've seen this for many years, right? Even in wars, etc. cetera, you, you destroy a, a village, Mai Le in Vietnam, Der Yassin in Palestine, to show the other villagers, look, that's what's going to happen to you if you, if you rebel. Uh, Torture, for example, we know that torture is actually not to get information of the one you torture, it's to say to the others, look what's going to happen if you do the same. And we can talk about preemptive wars as well. You know, it's about the neighboring countries. Look what we did to Iraq, you know, sh shut your mouth up. So what does this say, Julian's case, what I've, we've just talked about, about the future of our democracies? And I know you're going to say about democracies, but you've got the floor. Well, I mean, you talked about Milai. Of course, Seymour Hirsch, who, who, who printed that story and published that story and brought that to our attention, has since been largely sidelined. Uh, the propaganda machine went into high gear and he's and now Seymour Hirsch is sort of regarded as a peripheral figure who's not to be taken seriously by the machine, not by me. I would always listen to what he said, as I would always listen to Robert Fisk or any of the other people who are out there doing real journalism about real stories. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you use, you use the example of, for instance, the invasion of Iraq being a warning to Iran, I suppose is what you're saying. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe it is. Certainly Julian Assange is still that magpie fluttering in the hedge, you've used as an example to anybody else who might steal the machines, pheasant eggs or whatever it is that they're concerned about keeping. Um, and and he's still fluttering, still alive. He's not quite yet a dead magpie in a hedge. I did another, of, I had another of these conversations this morning with, um, sorry, that's my phone vibrating, with uh, Consortium, who had a webinar this morning, and uh, John Pilger was on it, but also on it, um, I'm trying to remember his name, he was called Alexander somebody or other, and he was a legal expert from London, and he was, he was fascinating, I think it's worth bringing up what he said here now. Um, he was very interesting talking about the appellate judges in the High Court in London, who they might be. And what, because I said, you know, these guys will all be, they'll all read the Times or the Telegraph or the Financial Times in the morning over there, boiled eggs and, and you know, milky coffee and da, 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 and they'll be very conservative. And then he agreed with all of that. But he said, you mustn't run away with the idea that they're all Vanessa Berets, who is clearly a foot soldier marching to orders. They're not. A lot of these judges are way better educated than she is. When you read the judgment that she came out with on Monday, she is clearly not a student of the law. It looks as if it's written by somebody who knows nothing about being a jurist or writing a judgment at all. She's a complete incompetent. So she's there specifically um, as a mouthpiece for the you know, US government officials who are sitting in the back of the court all the time telling her what to do and what to say and what to whatever. But when this goes to appeal, Alexander was saying, these will be men who care about their reputations and about their attachment to the law. Mm. Another thing to remember about the appeal court is that you are not allowed to introduce any new evidence in an appeal. It has to be based entirely upon the evidence that was given in the original hearing. Um, now, she read out most of the indictment, almost word for word, when she was giving her judgment on Monday. Why am I saying all this? Because I'm, because I'm listening to Yanis and Stephanie. How are we going to keep this guy alive? 
Now, I was somewhat encouraged by what Alexandra had to say in that he thinks that the appeal may happen within the next six or seven months. I, in my worst fears, was thinking a year, two years, blah, 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 blah. Um, what else have I got to report? Because I'm going to do that rather than giving pontificate about yeah. democracy. You can do that, Frank. You're really good at that. I don't mean at pontificating, but talking about the things. Um, I had something else to say about the judicial process, which which slips my mind now. When it comes back to me, I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to say, excuse me, sir, but I've just remembered and I want to say it. <laughs> so now I will uh, now I'll shut up and let somebody else say something. OK, I mean, we'll have time anyway um, after this sort of yeah. round, round yeah. table to, to have a, a I know what it was. Ah. I've just remember what it was. You didn't raise your but, finger. Uh, I, yeah, but it, I said, um, I had been talking about the choir, you know, I was saying, how do we do anything? How do we do anything? I was also most encouraged by Yanis saying, there has been a, a groundswell of opinion within the ranks of those who were not with us in 2014, 15, 16, 17, but they are coming to be with us now. So in, in my language, what Yanis is saying is the choir is growing. And as we all know, there's no point in us preaching not to the choir. The choir is our only potential lifeline. And if a lot of the choir are young, which I believe them to be, then that Certainly my job, my job is to encourage them, encourage them to sing together, encourage them to sing loud from the rooftops and to make an enormous noise because my friend in the legal, um, um, in the legal community in London tells me that whilst reading the, the uh, Financial Times and the Times and the Telegraph over breakfast, they are also hearing the news. And if the news is about this groundswell that Yanis was talking about and is about protest and is about people in the streets and about Stephanie writing articles and about you organizing these webinars. And about, if that is the news that the judges are hearing when the appeal court, the three of them get together, they will hear it, absorb it, take note of it and think, hmm, what should I do here? to protect myself and the reputation that I enjoy, that I am a servant of the law before I am a servant of the state. That was the other important. Many thanks, Roger. And I think that's, that's really one of what I want to focus on when we have this organic discussion. Um, uh, Stephanie, do you have to go? I can see you. Five minutes. Okay. It's okay. So that, that's what uh, I want to focus on. And we were talking money with Yanis before the live about us, I'm not going to call us the left or whatever, but us going on the offensive instead of being constantly sort of a, sort of a, a reactionary movement. I want to go to, to Ken before that. Um, Ken, you, I think it's important to remember how the WikiLeaks started. You know, Chelsea Manning, when she downloaded classified documents from US military servers, um, that exposed the U.S. war machine, U.S. war crimes, U.S. atrocities, U.S. torture. She actually first approached uh, U.S. mainstream newspapers, uh, and they passed. So then she went to Julian and WikiLeaks, and they started publishing publishing the, the, the documents. So, I mean, the case of Julian is about investigative journalism, but again, it's also about corporate journalism, and who, who owns the, the media, really? What's your take on this, Ken? Um, well, it, it's, um, it's, 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 it's one of those cases that, that, that clarifies the, the role of the media, doesn't it? Um, both the press and, and the broadcasters. Um, and uh, I think it's been said before that there's a, a collusion of, of silence. There doesn't need to be an active conspiracy. They all understand the steps of the dance. Um, we're going to keep quiet about this. Uh, the Guardian did publish some material, but then turned on Julian. Um, and it's um, uh, typical with the, with the liberal press. There's, there's a degree of hypocrisy that um, they, they, they wouldn't have a foot in both camps. They want to be both seen as the part of the responsible establishment. They also want to speak truth to power. Uh, but they're compromised on both fronts. 
um, and their attacks on Julian Assange, I think, were, were critical in undermining his presence as a, as a journalist and being seen as a journalist and the, the scurrilous attacks on him for year after year. Failure to really campaign against the torture mm -hmm. for 10 years. Um, and uh, finally, there was a kind of mealy mouth editorial, I believe, yesterday saying the case should be dropped. But there's, where is the blazing demand for the right of in, to investigate journalism? Um, and the, um, the, the leader of the NUJ, uh, Michelle Stanistreet, I, said, I think, said yesterday that, that the, the judge um, gave no defense to, to, uh, to the activities, the normal activities that most investigative journalists uh, undertake every day. Um, and, and it is absolutely an attack on the freedom of, of, of the press. Um, but the freedom of the press is, is something, it's a bit like Calvinism and free will. They, they have it so long as they choose not to exercise it. And um, they by and large choose not to exercise it. Um, and uh, Julian's case clarifies that, because if, if it were really a press to hold power to account, well, they fail over and over and over again. I mean, it's interesting where we remember some cases where investigative journalists have been heroes. Um, the, the Watergate tapes, um, you know, and exposing Nixon, um, obviously it should be exposed. But they're now um, heroic figures called on to pontificate every time there's a, an issue about um, press freedom and investigative journalism, they're wheeled out and, and they, they speak up. Um, Julian's put in prison. Um, and what is, what is so horrendous, I think, to, and, and I hope it's behind the surge of um, the movement that, that uh, Yanis talks about and, and Roger too, is that, this, this, there could not be a clearer case of shoot the messenger and let the scoundrel go free. I mean, here he, he you have people, Bush, Blair, propagandists like Alistair Campbell, wheeled out on the BBC on Newsnight, they have season tickets to the current affairs programmes to tell us what to think. They are responsible for, what, up to a million deaths? four or five million people made homeless, destruction of Iraq. Um, I mean, the most atrocious war crimes in an illegal war, an illegal war. So every crime is, every activity is illegal on account of that. War crimes, they should be indicted. The man who tells us about these crimes will, is, is condemned to rot at the very least and is in danger of never seeing the light of day again or of being executed. And we know some politicians in the States have called for precisely that. There could not be a more outrageous, a more egregious example of the messenger being crucified and the, the scoundrels, the villains, the criminals getting away with this. I mean, Pinochet's release get is pales by comparison. I mean, he only killed a few thousand. These, kill, these have killed hundreds of thousands. And the man who tells us the graphic details is, is, uh, suffers. And, and I think it's a huge test. I mean, it's a huge test both for the press and the courts um, now. Uh, if, if, if Julian loses, well, I say he loses his life and his liberty. If the press and the courts refuse, insist on this massive injustice and stay silent. It's a stay nowhere for the rest of the rest of time. Thanks, Ken. Um, Stephanie, I really don't want to kick you out, but I think we're gonna to have to say bye to you soon, right? And I yes, want to be polite certainly. and you know, you're the only woman on the panel, so I want to rest, um, say goodbye to you in a proper way. Um, um, so if you have to go, um, Thanks a million again for accepting to come at such short notice. And uh, thanks for the work you've been doing. And hopefully you can continue doing it um, despite the, the last few days. Thank you, Frank, for you. this. Sorry? I said thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks, you. Stefan. I just want to close with this one. So the war criminals, uh, the Blackwater, 
uh, work criminal tsar out Julian Assange in prison. He might die due to COVID or uh, whatever in prison. We know what kind of places prisons are. And finally, the people who destroy the entire nation are completely free as the air, whereas we are still speaking about the victims that never were as a result of the WikiLeaks publications. Because 10 years after publishing these documents, uh, we journalists have basically seen the US government in court uh, unable to provide a single example of, of a single person put in prison, died, injured due to these publications. So we are still basically discussing the victims that never were without dis uh, discussing the millions of people who died or became refugees due to these wars. This is tells you we live in a world of propaganda. We live in a real world of propaganda. This is all I want to say about this case. So thank you for inviting me and thanks to this wonderful panel. Thanks, Stefania. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For, for the rest of the, of the panel, we, we now have about 15, maybe 20 minutes uh, left. Um, we've, been we've been talking about a movement, maybe uh, the youth being more politicized than three decades ago. Um, Yanis talked about the fact that we had people that didn't say a word about Julian Assange a few months ago, but uh, that are now coming and speaking out. Uh, and I think obviously as, as a movement, and if you want to, as, as activists, if you want to build a movement, you've got to focus on, on small victories, right? Even though they can feel very tiny, uh, you've got to you've got to you know embrace them uh, to continue sort of um, going on. So so Yanis, I wanted to ask you. Uh, we spoke about this five minutes before the live about and again us, the movement, the left, whatever, being on the offensive. Uh, I, I I can just give a brief example. Someone that I dearly respect and love, um, Jeremy Corbyn, when he was brutally attacked, uh, brutally, he was attacked and called an anti-Semite and, um, and said he wanted the destruction of Israel and, and, and all this. I thought could have responded in a totally different way. And I thought, and that's the problem of the left, that by being that defensive and by saying in a way, oh, I didn't do that, oh, I didn't do that, oh, it played totally in the end of the far right. Uh, and as a movement, we have to stop doing that, right? We have to stop only responding to the attacks, but to be on the offensive ourselves. What, what do you, I, I know you agree, Yanis, because you, you've told me that just before, so. Well, it's not a very long time ago since uh, the Progressive International, a movement uh, that we, some of us started some time ago. Uh, and Roger was part of it, uh, Ken was part of it, uh, uh, Brian was part of it. We held what we call the Belmar Tribunal, inspired by um, a previous uh, uh, incarnation, uh, where we gathered for precisely the, 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 the purpose that you are articulating, to turn the tables. Uh, to, in, instead of constantly defending Julian, to start prosecuting the war criminals that are killing him as we speak. Uh, and that is, this is a process that we are, we are continuing. But um, you, you, you effectively, you, you're giving me a, a great um, pass uh, for discussing the assassination that precedes the actual murder. And that's the character assassination. Uh, what you mentioned regarding Jeremy, um, is precisely what I experienced in 2015, when suddenly I, I was actually warned. This is this is something that I don't think any of you knows, but I was in the White House in April of 2015 as the Minister of Finance of Greece, and I would I just had a chat with Obama, and as I was coming out, a former student of a friend of mine, who worked as part of the White House, approached me and he said, "Minister, can I have a word with you? We're sitting next to a toilet, you know." <laughs> And he said, um, I, I feel the, the obligation to warn you that uh, in 10 days, there's going to be a character assassination against you. Precisely 10 days later, 
every major newspaper, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, The Times of London, you know, El País, all of them unleashed a torrent of abuse against me. You're just complete fake news about me, about what it was I was saying I was doing. I experienced that. Why? Because it, that, that was the moment when the, the, the will of the Greek people had to be bent and, you know, we had to fold and Varoufakis had to get out of the way. It, so they, they created uh, essentially um, uh, a narrative that made it impossible for any of my arguments or facts to emerge because suddenly it became something about me. This is exactly what they did with Jeremy. And this is exactly what they did with Julian. And, you know, the, the establishment, the deep state, and so on, call it whatever you want, the oligarchy, they've become much, much better at it than they used to be. Because back in the 1960s and the 1970s, you know, they, 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 they would accuse you of being a communist. Right? Well, they accuse me of being a Marxist. I am a Marxist. I mean, I'm not going to really suffer for that much if you accuse me of being a left-winger, right? I am a left-winger. But now what they do is something far worse. They accuse you of something that really hurts you. Calling somebody like us a racist, a bigot, an anti-Semite, um, you know, a rapist. This is what really hurts because, you know, if anybody calls me a rapist today, right? Even if it's complete baloney, right? I feel as a feminist, I have the, the need to give the woman implied or in, 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 involved somehow in this accusation, the opportunity to speak against me, because this is what we left-wingers do. So this is what they do. The character assassination of Julian Assange, okay, is what? That he was, um, he, that he elected Trump <laughs> single-handedly, right? And that he was a rapist. Now, look, I don't want to get deeply into this, but allow me to, to do some, uh, reporting, right? And so I'm going to finish off with an account of a discussion I had with Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy in November 2017. Um, I, it, it, it's no secret to the United States authority because uh, as I found out recently, I actually watched the video that they taped of me <laughs> speaking to Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy as part of a court case that the Spanish judge started. Um, against the company employed to videotape me and Julian having this conversation, right? So I'm only telling you that which the NSA already knows. <laughs> um, okay, so he had actually sent me a message. I was in Athens and he said, I need to speak to you. Can you get on a plane and come to London? Which I did. I did that a number of times on a number of issues. But this is of interest to all of us, especially in the context of the character assassination of calling him a Trumpist. Yeah? So, you know, almost every discussion we had for years was all about how to get him out, you know, different ways and campaigns and so on. The purpose of, of which, just like what we're doing today, is to save his life and get him out of there. Uh, and he said to me, you know, one of the Republican senators came to visit me recently. I thought, oh my God, that's big news, yeah? A senator going into the Ecuadorian embassy along with somebody else. And they offered me a pardon, a presidential pardon from Trump. Uh, I said, okay, on condition of um, that uh, I reveal that the Hillary Clinton emails, over which Trump had the problem at the time, if you remember, right? Uh, with the Mueller investigation and so on, uh, did not come from the Russians. And I said, uh, Julian, from what you've told me in the past, you don't know where your information comes from. I mean, WikiLeaks is structured in such a way that it's double blind, mm. right? Um, nobody knows anything. You, even Julian does not know who is sending the stuff to WikiLeaks. This is the whole point of the design of the software. He said, yes, that's, that's true. But this person who actually gave me the emails, the Hillary Clinton emails, actually made himself known to me himself or herself, I'm not sure, right? And uh, I said, so what? It's, you, can you confirm that it was not the Russians? He said, absolutely. I said, well, why don't you then? He said, because that goes against the whole principle of WikiLeaks, non-disclosure of sources. I said, well, what if your source is okay with the idea of being disclosed? He said, well, look, firstly, it's very dangerous because if I get in touch with this person 
they, they may find out that I got in touch with this person and therefore he may be find, found out, he or she may be found out. So I do not want to jeopardize that person. But even if they gave me the okay to disclose that I got the emails from them, it would be against the, the principles of WikiLeaks to do this. So I said, so what did you do? I said, well, what did you say to the, to, to, to the Trump uh, representative? He said, I told them to fuck off. Now, this is the man we're talking about, right? I mean, I, you know, I find Julian infuriating many times. You know, this, I find most of, of my friends infuriating. I find myself infuriating. You know, I clash with him, with him, you know, this is what it means to be friends, right? But he's a man of principle. He had a chance of being pardoned by telling the truth. But because that would mean disclosing um, his host sources, he didn't do it. And I said, you know, you may be, you know, you may end up in a supermax prison as a result of that. He said, yeah, I know. And the worst thing he said to me is that because I will have done the, turned the Trump, the Trump people down, they will be even more determined to bring me down. That was in November 2017. I have the video. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Yanis. Uh, we we have like you know a few minutes left, and um, I'd like to uh, to continue to talk about being on the offensive. I mean, Yanis talked about character assassination. I think the four of you know exactly what it's about. Um, I mean, Ken, you've been called many names over the years. <laughs> Roger as well, Brian as well, uh, and and that's the thing. I remember Brian, you telling me a story about. Um, about Israel Palestine, that every time you sort of speak out on Palestine, no, maybe not every time, but actually w when you speak on Palestine now and then, you receive in 24, 48 hours a torrent of females and messages. Um, and it's obviously organized. You know, when you mentioned at one point, that was a few years ago, you got like 4,000 messages or emails after you signed a petition or something. So and that's the way it works, right? We, we're talking about the troll, the, the trolls on Facebook, on the internet. But that's, I mean, the movement has to be financed somewhere. We know, for example, Israel spends millions into uh, fighting uh, pro-Palestinian or pro-justice activists. But um, how can we react to that? Because, I mean, obviously, it scares a lot of people. What happened to you, Brian? And we've had chat with other artists um, and um and cultural personalities in the past, where they said the first time I spoke out on, on an issue like Palestine or any other, uh, not any other, sorry, like Palestine, um, the torrent of abuse was so high that it shut me up. I, I needed support and I, I needed, you know, and I didn't get it. And as a, as a movement, I guess that's what we need to do as well, right? Uh, make sure people have, you know, we've got their backs in a way. Yes, I mean, it seems to me that what we have to do is to make it something that a journalist would want to talk about. You know, we want to make it something that consolidates their reputation rather than destroys it. And that's a sort of snowball that once it gets going, you don't have to look after it that much anymore. But, but at the moment, um, I think the fact that journalists don't talk about this at all is partly because they aren't well informed and they have the propaganda campaign against Julian in their minds, you know, that he was a rapist, that he was acting in a morally incorrect way, that he was a threat to national security and so on. So all of those things are in the back of people's minds and haven't been investigated or debugged properly. Um, but, but the other thing is, you know who owns the press you know if you if you if you're a journalist and you want to keep your job perhaps it does take some kind of courage to say to keep beating this drum you know stefania didn't say why she left la republica but i can imagine that what she was wanting to write about wasn't that popular there as an issue so we have to somehow get get it to be a thing among journalists that it's rather shameful not to be on Assange's side. At the moment, the best place to be from a career point of view is not on his side. We, we somehow want to turn that so that, you know, just, just as you will now see rats jumping from the sinking Trump ship in America, and they'll suddenly appear on the other side. 
<laughs> let's hope we can do that with some journalist rats as well. Yeah, it, it, it's a struggle for consciousness, isn't it? And, and it goes across, um, it goes across politics. Um, and I mean, the, the idea of capitalism is very strong, even though it's collapsing. Um, the, the reality is it's weak, you know, Yanis has said. And um, it's a struggle for consciousness. And, and the problem we've got at the moment, because of the pandemic, because the mainstream media is close to us, the broadcasters are state appointments, governed by state appointments. And uh, when, they're, when they're least confident, they, uh, they are most censorious. Mm -hmm. So when they feel vulnerable or when, they, when the, the deep state or whatever feels vulnerable, then, then, they, then, then you can't speak. Um, and they're more censorious on the news than they are on the general current affairs programs, they're more censorious on those than they are on the more liberal documentaries, and you're most free if you write fiction. But there's a kind of graded censorship, yeah. and it's to do with their with their confidence in that they can they there are no threat, we are no threat to their power. Mm -hmm. um, and our answer has always been mass demonstrations. You know, we go out on the streets, and that's difficult now. Um, we have social media, but uh, it, you know it's beyond my pay grade. That it's you know others will know better um, how effective that is than I do. But I can barely turn the bloody thing on. So it's it's. Um, it, I, I think that's a, that's our problem is, is finding a finding um, a substitute for being out of. I mean, if, if we weren't under the restrictions of the pandemic, there would have been many many hundreds of people outside probably thousands outside the court yesterday, uh, the day before. So it's, um, th th that's our problem. I, I'm, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is, but um, as soon as we can get on, on the street, then they have something to report. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. What's your solution, Roger? I, w I was I was going to say, um, Roger, we've got, like, I've, I've promised you guys and I've promised people we won't go over an hour. So... I'll give you the last, the final words, Roger. You were the last one to arrive on the panel. Oh my God! I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be the last I'm, one to speak. I'm, I'm, I'm still sort of happily amused and chuckling over the idea that Ken can't turn his iPhone, <laughs> and that some, and and in consequence. But what I was thinking was, in consequence, this this actually frees him, you know, because my mind was full of the fact that almost everything, particularly in written drama that we ever see on TV nowadays, is about the fact that the younger generation are slaves to their fucking iPhones. They never speak to each other. They just, and, and, and actually, I bet all of us know from our own experience that there is some awful truth in that general labeling of a whole generation that is not actually engaged eye to eye, heart to heart, shell to shell with their contemporaries. They don't sit in the pub and talk about, as far as we know. But maybe that is changing. Maybe they, maybe a few of them are resisting the temptation to sit in their bedroom playing video games their whole fucking life, you know, from, which is a huge temptation. I've seen it. I've seen it in my own family, naming no names. But um, so, so th th these are like, you know, these, these are very, very serious things that we have to confront. Also whirling around in my brain is the whole, um, you know, propaganda smearing anti-Semite thing, which I have been involved in because I've been smeared with all kinds of brushes. I actually went to my iPhone while we were listening to all this to look up a name, and I found it with a date, March the 5th, 2019. I asked somebody who shall remain nameless, who was that fucking CIA bloke that you brought round to my house to threaten me? Because they sent somebody to my house uh, to say, now, listen, your, your activism on behalf of the Palestinians, I, don't you think it might be better if you toned everything down a bit? Wouldn't you rather be Martin Luther King than Malcolm X? Just nudging me gently away from being a fucking loudmouth, you know? And I sat and listened to all this stuff. And eventually, this guy said to me, he, he leant forward and he looked at me and he said, I just wouldn't want to see anything happen to you, Roger. Oh, God, no. 
His name's Jack Devine. He now runs a hugely powerful security business all over the world. And he used to run one of the main desks in the CIA, maybe the Middle East desk in the CIA when he was still working for the CIA. So there you go, Jack. Good fucking luck, mate, but you're not scaring me off. I mean, it may sound stupid, but and they didn't actually kill me. And they, this was several years ago. So, but yeah, exactly. But it is. It, it we do live in a strange world, which and um, but which is why it's been so nice for the last hour or whatever to sit and listen to you guys. To, you know, to be in to be with the voice of reason sitting in a room, and but it still it leaves us though with with this problem sitting on our laps collectively all of us and with all the choir however many of them we can join to the struggle is we have to for the sake of every man woman and child on earth we need to save julian assange from the machine which is trying to grind him into mincemeat okay so and we will we bloody well will he will go home to you know um, to his missus and his two kids, and he will be re rehabilitated, and he will publish again. That's the most important thing. We need him not just to be free out of Belmarsh. We need him to be doing his job. We need WikiLeaks to be up and running and doing the great work that he did when he was at the helm. I'm not saying it's not probably not, but obviously you know, Kristen and the others at WikiLeaks now, a, a, a lot of their energy is having to be focused on this and selling T-shirts to try and get, you know, the cash and the wherewithal that's necessary to get him back. So all we can do is gird our loins and leap into the fray even harder and take more risks and shout louder. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Roger. Uh, that's, uh, I guess, a, a very good way to, to, to end this. Um, uh, we will stop when it's over, right? Um, yeah. That's actually the quote. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the quote I wanted to, you know, last time. Very easy quote. I forgot. Now I remember. We'll stop when it's over. Uh, thanks. Thanks a million. Um, that was amazing. Uh, thanks, Yanis. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Ken. Um, and Thank you, and so, so, so solidarity with Julian. Of yeah. course, and uh, let's yeah. keep fighting. I mean, again, focusing on the positive, he hasn't been sent to the US. So um, that's, that's a, a small victory, but it's, it's one that we should um, think about. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.